Welcome everyone to our first online MDI Science Cafe. We're excited to have everyone join us uh, in this new format. And while we're sad that we can't be together in one room, we're excited that through the uh, marvels of modern technology, we are able to stay in touch and keep everyone uh, together via this format. So thanks again for joining us. And I'm thrilled this morning to have Dr. Herman Haller, who's the president of the MDI Biological Laboratory, along with uh, Dr. Ian Drummond, who is our director of research and director of the Catherine W. Davis Center for Regeneration and Aging. They're joining us today to share their perspectives, uh, both as a physician scientist and as a physician who has done a lot of uh, research on areas related to some of these challenges that we're facing with the COVID-19 pandemic, and to just have a conversation about um, sort of what's happening, what we've learned about COVID-19, and some of the measures that uh, we can all in apply to help us sort of battle this um, current situation. So I, with that, I want to turn it over uh, to Ian Drummond. And Ian, welcome. And um, we look forward to hearing the conversation between you and Dr. Howard. Thank you, Jerry. I think it's very important that we have this communication to stay up, keep everyone up to date on what's going on. And uh, we're lucky to have Herman here with frontline experience dealing with the virus. Uh, so Herman, we've had four weeks now of COVID-19. Everyone seems to be worried about getting sick naturally. And what have you seen on the front lines? What is COVID-19? Uh, thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, what you're doing at the moment is you're sharing the conversations Ian and uh, Cherry and I are having almost every day now for the last three weeks in order to keep MDIBL safe. Uh, I am in uh, Germany at the moment uh, as a medical doctor. Uh, Ian has asked me about the front line. And yes, I have seen quite a few patients, uh, both on ICU, uh, in outpatient clinic, and in the hospital, so different settings. And uh, most patients, as you know, have uh, almost no symptoms at all. So I've seen people with flu-like symptoms and uh, they came in, they saw a doctor and they were sent home and they got better within a couple of days. I've seen patients with more severe symptoms, uh, pulmonary distress, and uh, thankfully, a lot of these patients, mostly with fever and lung problems, they stay in the hospital for a couple of days some of them for 10 days, uh, they may, may need some oxygen and then they get better. This tells us that the lungs are affected. And at the moment, although we have been looking at kidneys and at other organs, it's mostly the lung. And then rarely, however, with the wave of patients we are seeing, too many patients have to go on ICU and they have severe pneumonia, caused by the reaction of their bodies to the virus. The pneumonia is novel. Uh, we see a lot of mucus formation uh, and it's persistent. So the biggest problem is that the pneumonia stays with the patient for a couple of days, sometimes two weeks. And this means we need a lot of ventilation over a long period of time. And this is where it becomes dangerous because when you are healthy, you can survive that. But if you have other conditions like heart conditions, then it's more difficult. And then I've seen patients uh, and uh, they didn't make it. Thankfully enough in Germany, the rate, the percentage is lower than 1%, which is very reassuring. Okay, uh, thanks, Herman. Um, we've had other viral diseases like influenza. What makes this one so different? Oh. Uh, there are two reasons why uh, we have such a panic. Uh, we all know, but we tend to forget that uh, epidemics in some years uh, caused by the flu virus are causing a lot of death. 
uh, with this virus, with COVID-19, we have a virus which is highly contagious, even more than the flu virus. And at the same time, we have never met this virus before. And this is a deadly combination. So a lot of patients get sick very rapidly. It's like a wave. And although only less than 20% have symptoms from this infection, the, just, the, the numbers of this wave are so high. And this is why we have such a problem. I think in the future, we still, as long as we don't have a vaccine, we will have outbreaks of uh, coronavirus and COVID-19, but they will be much smaller. They will be in nursing homes, or they will be in uh, a class, in schools. So they are much easier to contain. But at the moment, with the worldwide spread, we are having this international wave of the disease. So everyone's wondering how long we'll have to be in quarantine or in lockdown. People are wondering how to prevent the, the spread, a second wave. Do you think that the extension of the current social distancing is the way to go forward from here? Yes, both in, uh, when you look at it from the scientific point of view and from a pragmatic view, you know, how can we handle the situation? I think uh, social distancing and personal hygiene, and this is you wash your hands and you don't touch your face. These are the most crucial preventive measures uh, we have to do in order to prevent spreading. If you then add masks, especially in situations where you can't avoid that several people are in the same room, uh, then I think these are the measures we need to contain the virus once this wave uh, has, gone da uh, has gone down a little bit. Uh, in addition to that, we, there is not a lot what we can do. We'll talk about medications uh, in a while, uh, but uh, the only solution in the long run will be a vaccine. Sounds about right to me. I can speak to what we've been doing at MDIBL to deal with the virus. And it's a complicated issue because we have several issues simultaneously. First, we have to do our part to prevent the spread of the virus globally. Second, we have to protect our employees who must be at work uh, from getting the virus. And third, we have to figure out ways to keep our science going. So in the first part, we've practiced social distancing, hand washing, we're introducing masks this week, um, and primarily limiting the number of people on campus with staggered schedules, uh, limiting one person per room in close quarters like the animal facility where people have to work and get in to feed animals. Uh, but most important is just uh, preserving our distance from each other. And I, you can see challenges going forward as we try to come back to work. Um, the second thing we did was limit people and personnel to only employees entering the inner campus of MDIBL. It was important to create a safe space for people so that they had to come to work. They didn't see people that they didn't know who may not have been uh, subscribing to the same levels of concern that we are. Um, Another major thing we've been doing is communicating with our staff. And Dr. Haller has been writing daily letters about the conditions around the globe, but also about issues at MDIBL. And we've received real positive feedback on our communication. Um, and I think it matters a lot, even, even if we don't have solutions for every problem, just to know that we're working on them. Um, I think going forward uh, with our science is a challenge in these days. But with staggered schedules, people doing essential experiments have been able to continue. We've also continued our contacts with new recruits and onboarding them. So we're ready to hit the ground running when the time comes. We've expanded our technical capabilities with acquisition of new equipment for things like single cell RNA sequencing. Uh, and we're preparing pipelines for informatics to deal with that deluge of data when it will come when we get back to work. 
and we continue to upgrade our microscopes. So we, I feel that when the limits are lifted, we'll be able to hit the ground running and we're all looking forward to that. Still, there'll be challenges in, in how we work together and we don't expect to go back to normal right away. Um, more continued social distancing, mask wearing, really transitioning to a respect for each other's health as much as trying to prevent getting the disease ourselves. Um, Herman, what can we say to people about our educational programs and where we hope to be with them and the changes we're making to deliver content online? Yeah, uh, that's a very good question. I wrote a letter this morning about uh, these problems and we have been discussing it over the last two weeks. Uh, a lot of programs uh, already have been canceled uh, for this summer. Uh, we were a bit hesitant. We were still trying to find solutions. But while we were discussing how to deal with dining problems, with uh, housing problems, with uh, rules for when we have students on campus and what it means for quarantine, while we were discussing how to test and how fast will we be with testing, we all realized that this is not what the education at MDIBL uh, is really like. We have a strong feeling of community. We are living and we are working together during the summer and we have been doing this for a long time, almost a hundred years, where we had students and this exposure and the strong bonding between mentors and students, this is what actually uh, is at the core of MDIBL education. So I think we will not have a residential summer program this year because it's against what we normally do at MDIBL. Instead, we will concentrate like other institutions and we will work together with the College of the Atlantics and the Jackson Lab to be online. So you will see us and our educational program online and we'll put all our effort into not only excellent teaching, but to get the spirit of MDIBL across even on the internet. It's a great opportunity to reshape our curriculum so that we can have a broader reach nationally, internationally. And these days media plays such a role in everyone's lives that getting ourselves out there more uh, really can only help us to spread our, our, our mission. Yeah. Um, I can bring you up to date on what MDIBL has been doing locally. Um, a number of people are sewing their own masks and contributing them to the campus for people to wear. We'll be acquiring masks to hand out to visitors when and if we open up soon. Um, I personally have been uh, 3D printing face shields for the local hospital. Uh, so that's kept me busy in, in times at home. Uh, but I think we're all proud to say that uh, we stay in touch locally with the Mount Desert Island Hospital, with the Jacks, uh, with the College of the Atlantic, and uh, everyone seems to have each other's backs. So that's been a heartening um, experience in local communication and support. Um, we get some questions from others that have come from outside that um, I think we can address. Um, so Herman, people are really wonder why the experience of COVID-19 can be so different for different people. And people are naturally concerned that they could get a severe dose, but hear a lot about people with no symptoms at all. And some of the questions that arise are, does it matter what kind of dose of infection you get, a viral dose? Yeah. And how is the, your susceptibility to the virus, how is it impacted by pharmaceuticals you're already taking, for instance, immunosuppressant drugs? Yeah. Well, these are very good questions, and uh, one can best answer this when we look at what a viral infection with the coronavirus actually, uh, how it works. Uh, so you get the virus, and from all what we know at the moment is inhaling the virus, uh, or bringing the virus via your hands to your mouth or nose, 
uh, to your mouth or nose. That's the most important way of entry for the virus. When you touch surfaces, you may also do this, but we are getting now more and more data that uh, to uh, have contact with services uh, and uh, transmit the virus there is not happening that often or is not that important for getting the disease. Now, once you have a certain amount of the virus and uh, from the data we have worldwide, it's when you mix and mingle with people and you inhale the virus, then the virus has to be taken up by your cells. And this depends on the surface of your cells. Actually, we are doing research on that. We work on glycocalyx. These are the sugar, uh, sugar structures the virus adheres to. And uh, then the virus is taken up. So the degree of adherence of the virus and how rapidly the virus is taken up determines the first level of disease activity. Then the virus... Uh, is replicating in your cells, especially in the epithelial cells of the lung, uh, and then it's spreading through the lungs and through the body. And you actually get sick not from having the virus, but your body then recognizes the virus and responds to the virus. And the way you respond defines how severely sick you will become. And in some patients, there is a very strong response, which is good under most conditions, but not when you have a new virus. And sometimes, interestingly, we have immunocompromised patients, and they are not that sick. My experience, for instance, I'm a kidney doctor, and we have lots of patients on dialysis, and they are all immunocompromised because of their renal problem. Astonishingly, not a lot of them have serious disease. They have infections, but they get not that sick because their body is not reacting in such a traumatic fashion. It's also a good experience to learn that patients on immunosuppressants, like after kidney transplantation, we are also, although we expect it otherwise, we don't see that many sick patients. So that's reassuring. It depends on the state of your immune system. I have seen one patient, 19 years old, very severe disease, undetected problem in his immune system, which was only picked up while we were treating the disease. So the viral dose is important. You should not inhale. And uh, <laughs> that's an important message. And don't touch your mouth or your nose, especially when you have not washed your hands before. It's, it's really interesting, the relationship between the immune system and the disease and the over, overblown responses that can be very dangerous for humans. It reminds me that uh, the animals that carry coronavirus, bats, other animals, the reason they can keep them and stay alive is they don't seem to respond to them. So they have a suppressed immune response to coronavirus that lets the virus stick around in their bodies and transmit it. So it's a, it's a, it seems a complicated balance between resisting disease and not making too hard a, a fight. So it's uh, more, more work, no doubt, will lead to interesting answers on that score. And we should be reminded, you know, 80% of the patients uh, who harbor the virus have no symptoms. So these patients are more behaving like bats and it's causing then a totally different problem. And this is asymptomatic carriers of the virus. Is eventually I don't think it's as high as 80% though. Just, I think 80% don't go to ICU, but I think it's more like 40% are asymptomatic. Yeah, but we'll find out the numbers will change. But uh, quite a lot of patients, uh, not patients, people have the disease and don't respond. Yeah, it's it's really a mysterious, and I think that's made it such a challenge for public health officials to deal with it, knowing where to find it even. Yeah. Um, that might lead to a question about testing and the impact of testing and how much we can know to, uh, in the future, contact trace individuals. Will that be a, a better way of dealing with the pandemic than a global 
lockdown? Uh, I, I'm sure about that. Uh, in fact, if once we have testing available in all hospitals, uh, so you can get the test and you know whether you're positive or negative within a couple of hours, makes all the difference in the world. Because then somebody with a fever, somebody with uh, clinical symptoms uh, is tested, and then you can immediately quarantine this patient very easily and the people around this person. It's not even necessary, I think, in the future to actually track down everybody, but just to make a medical history, find out whom you have been talking to, it's important to understand that you have to be in the same room and you have to, uh, you have to talk to a person for about 15 minutes before you actually have a contact. It's not passing by. If you pass by and you sneeze and you, a lot of viruses have handed over to the other person, but normally, same room, 15 minutes. So once we test and we know this, then I think we can really uh, contain future events much better than uh, we do at the moment. So speaking of containing... The uh, other uh, issue is testing for antibodies. So we'll be able to see if we've had a response. Yes. And um, when, uh, once you went through a relationship, so to speak, with the virus, your immune system is recognizing the virus. Even if you don't have severe disease, your immune cells uh, have picked up the new proteins and uh, uh, the new sugar coats also from the viruses, and you make antibodies. And we can detect these antibodies and then tell people, yes, you are immune. We don't know for how long. That's unfortunate. But at least for a couple of months, we can tell people you are on the safe side. These antibodies, and that was another question, could be used to treat patients. And actually some groups are working on that. To be honest, it's attractive. Some of you may remember this uh, Hollywood movie with Dustin Hoffman, when he was isolating these antibodies from this small monkey and infusing it into his almost dying wife and saving her life. So that's an attractive uh, idea. However, whether it will work in patients, we don't know. And I think it's complicated and I would bet on a vaccine. And here I'm much more optimistic. With all the efforts worldwide at the moment and Bill Gates really moving into uh, this research project uh, with a lot of effort and money, I think we'll get a vaccine. We are, it's hard to make a vaccine against the virus. We know this because we still don't have a vaccine against the other SARS epidemic seven years ago. But now I think there will be much more effort, much more support worldwide. And I think uh, that scientists will solve that problem. Yeah, it's very hopeful. I'm, I feel the same. I think uh, people have a lot more confidence when we have a vaccine, obviously. Uh, back to more simple matters. Um, we have a new recommendation of wearing masks, but I think people are getting mixed messages about masks and what they do, what we can expect from them. What's your sense on whether people should wear masks in public or not? Hmm. I'm on the one hand a scientist, on the other hand very pragmatic. If you wear a mask, the number of droplets you're spreading is reduced. So I think, first of all, you protect your neighbor. And this is why it's so important wearing a mask. You may not like it. <clears throat> Some people hate masks, but it's a question of courtesy and protecting your neighbor wearing masks. So if everybody in a room, eight people or so, is wearing a mask, everybody is much more protected. So the recommendation is a good one, although I have to admit uh, controlled prospective studies on wearing masks in epidemics are lacking. 
And this is why scientists uh, like me and Ian, you know, we are always uh, very conscious about, we only uh, tell you that we know when we have done prospective trials, scientists were a bit more hesitant with their recommendations. I understand that, but on a pragmatic level, it's better to wear masks. And as I said before, we will do this at MDIBL and uh, we'll protect our neighbors and uh, it's a demonstration, I care for you. Yeah, I agree. I think uh, the mindset needs to be now, we need to be respectful of our neighbors and not just worry about ourselves getting sick. So it's a good social movement and also uh, gives people some new fashion statements, I think. We'll see some interesting uh, creative masks coming out in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, on another, have, uh, another topic on, go ahead, Herman. One remark, we have been discussing sharks and other fish, uh, axolotls. We'll have all sorts of experimental MDIBL animals on our mask eventually. Collector's items, I'm sure. Uh, people want to know all this buzz about hydroxychloroquine. Uh, people don't know if it's been tested by the FDA. They don't know if it actually works. There's a lot of hype from our president about it. What's your sense of whether we should be using that? Yeah, that's a very uh, complicated question. Um, I have been, uh, I had uh, uh, telephone uh, conversations with our colleagues in China because they have the most experience. Uh, I've been to Wuhan very often before the epidemic, so I know quite a, a few doctors there. Uh, and they have, as you can imagine, all sorts of medications during the epidemic. And sometimes they have seen in a non-prospective fashion an effect. So they have seen this with some of the antiviral drugs. They have seen an effect with hydroxychloroquine in France. There was a small study even controlled and they have seen a positive effect. Others have not seen an effect. I have patients and they are treated and they're on hydroxychloroquine because they have other autoimmune diseases such as lupus. They have not become sick, but whether this proves that hydroxychloroquine is good or not, I don't know. I have to admit when I first traveled to Boston four weeks ago, uh, I was tempted to take some hydroxychloroquine with me just to be on the safe side. And some of my colleagues uh, uh, made this recommendation to their patients. However, the problem is that this drug, when a lot of people are taking the drug, is not without side effects. So this means, yes, you may be protected, but we don't know. However, there are serious side effects when you take hydroxychloroquine and you have to take it at a relatively high concentration. So at the moment, it's very hard to make a recommendation. The Bayer company has given a lot of hydroxychloroquine, uh, which was a good move, but at the same time, they made the recommendation, be aware of the side effects of the drug. The question is also, do we have other drugs? And on the one hand, there are some drugs which may alter the course of the infection antiviral drugs, they have not worked in flu epidemics. I think the number of patients actually profiting from drugs at the moment will be small. This makes it so difficult to re recommend something. We don't have a drug which solves the problem. The best recommendation we can come up with, and we had the question, for instance, for antihypertensive drugs, do they make the disease worse? Major changes in drug intake at the moment will put you at more risk than taking a medication which is not proven at the moment. I know this is disappointing. You expect from a medical doctor a recommendation, take this drug and you get better. At the moment, we can't do that. So let me ask you, Herman, um, no matter what we say or no matter what people here on the news, a lot of people will try things. They'll try taking hydroxychloroquine. 
what would you say are the side effects people should look out for to say maybe you shouldn't be taking hydroxychloroquine? Yeah, that's difficult to tell because uh, the side effect, the more serious side effects you only see when you do lab tests. You know, they may have effects uh, on uh, bone marrow and, uh, and this is what I'm talking about. These are serious side effects which do not happen very often but you don't know. This is why it's so difficult to make a recommendation. Maybe a small effect, a small protective effect. Uh, I can't tell you whether you should take the drug while you have no symptoms. We think that the drug interrupts the processing of the virus intracellularly by changing the pH in some of uh, the endosomes. Uh, whether this affects then the rate of viral reproduction, most likely, whether it affects in any way your response to the virus, we don't know. So caution is advised. Um, yes, and uh, I, I would here, I, I don't want to argue with uh, the president, but uh, I think recommendations for taking drugs where we have no clear evidence at the moment and a, lo a lot of patients will follow that, we should be more cautious. That makes sense. Well, one thing you and I have been talking a lot about is how, do, how will we get back to normal? How will, what, what does the next six months look like after a surge in cases, how can we restore the vibrant excitement about science on the MDIBL campus? Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how our decision-making process is going about how to reopen the campus and how it'll be different. Uh, very difficult. Um, we are following a couple of rules, and I think this is very important, rules for establishing a policy. Number one is we should use scientific evidence and uh, we should uh, protect ourselves. Very important. We have to make all people on MDIBR campus feel safe. And there is a lot of anxiety. And the anxiety level is different for different people. We have young scientists there and they tell us, okay, now, you know, I, I don't care. If I'm exposed, then I'll be immune afterwards. And we have others and they tell us, I'm very much afraid. We have people with uh, concomitant diseases. If you are in the age range and you have coronary artery disease, you may not want to be exposed to even the slightest chance that somebody will carry the virus is uh, detrimental. So we take this into consideration. On the other hand, we have to make this a livable, livable campus again. And so Ian and I already mentioned that. Distancing and hygiene will be very important. I think for the next couple of months when we have meetings, not online, but sitting together in a room, we'll wear masks. And by that, we can protect ourselves to a large extent. I'm really not worried about infection while uh, we are following these rules. The big question is when people come from outside. Here, I think we need testing within several hours. It would be very helpful to be able to tell people before they even come on campus, uh, we can test you, we can see whether you're either immune or whether you're carrying the virus. And once they are negative, then following these rules, they can come on campus. This means we can't run larger conferences for the next couple of months because we will not be able to deal with a lot of people but we may be able to deal with smaller groups. And I think this is something we should take home. The message that if you wash your hands, if you keep the distance, 
you may be able to interact. Uh, it may not be cozy, but you can have dinner with your friends in a couple of months without being terrified of getting the virus. You may perhaps not want to go into bars which are packed with people for quite a while. I think we only feel safe to do this uh, when we are in protected areas or when we have a vaccine uh, eventually, hopefully. So this is what we'll do. We'll try to get back to normal, but we'll try to follow these rules. And while we think of the people with the high anxiety level, we also have to remind the others. And I'm very pessimistic about the educational aspects. I think people will forget, at least some people, how dangerous it can be and how easily you can be infected. So keeping distance and uh, washing your hands, uh, I think it will uh, need some work to remind people, especially when in July, coronavirus and COVID-19 will not be on the news a lot. Yeah, so keeping it in the forefront of people's mind, this, this is a cultural shift at the campus in terms of protecting each other's health. I'd say one of the optimistic things is we're getting, uh, we have set up an email line for staff, uh, technicians, PIs, to cite issues they see at the campus and gives us a chance to respond and come up with solutions. Simple things like uh, how many people in the break room, uh, how many people uh, at the microwave, uh, can we designate spaces? So the good thing about MDIBL is we have sufficient space, I think, for the people and we're flexible. So we can imagine setting up uh, appropriate spaces for people to maintain social distancing, if only to get our work back on track. And I think that's the important first step is having people feel safe and confident coming back to work so we can get our science going and keep what we've been doing uh, productive. Yeah. So, and Ian, Ian, you mentioned this in the beginning. Uh, we are all set. Once the epidemic is over, we have new recruits. Uh, we have a new microscopy core facility with uh, fascinating new microscopes. We are setting up new techniques. MDIBL is waiting. <laughs> we are waiting uh, for the epidemic to be over. I think we'll be ready. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. Okay. be different but we'll we'll have a lot to do so um thanks herman i think we covered a lot of the questions we didn't get to all the questions that were sent but i think we covered a lot of important ones so um, i hope it was a useful discussion for everyone yeah thanks jerry thanks to thanks, you both. Jerry. and you'll find you'll find a way to uh bring uh, to how all the questions can be answered i'm sure about that Sure, we will continue to, to work to answer all those questions. Um, but thank you both for taking the time to share your perspectives and to share you know, the most recent information and data that we have on COVID-19. But I think more importantly, uh, sh sharing a bit of hope for the future and thinking about getting things back on track after the worst of, of the epidemic um, is behind us. So that is, I think, a good message and an important one for us to share with everyone today. So thank you again. And thanks to all of you for joining us. Um, we hope that this will be the first of, of a number of online uh, science cafes as we work to um, transition kind of back to an, what, what we hope will be our new normal. Uh, but in the meantime, we look forward to staying in touch with everyone through this format and um, look forward to our next cafe, which will be in May. So thanks again, everyone. And we will uh, stay safe, stay well, and we'll be in touch.